Um, well, let's start talking about questions that we can ask. When I'm on the street, I typically have a tract in my hand. I like to say, I feel naked without my tracts. <laughs> That's just my own inadequacy and my own learned co uh, codependency, <laughs> uh, dependency. And when I, ask, when I hand out a tract, I'm largely looking at body language to see if I should just not press it, not follow up. But if there's a little bit of uh, sort of nonverbal openness to talking, maybe there's, it's, maybe, maybe there's like a, a slowing down or a not speeding up, you know. They take one and I'm like, where are you from? I like to start asking questions that will start a conversation. And uh, my typical go-to questions are, you know, where are you from? Um, as the conversation progresses and it's not clear what religious background they have, um, I like to ask, do you go to church anywhere? This is a good ski lift question, by the way, in Utah. You go to church anywhere? I asked a guy, uh, you go to church anywhere? I mean, it was like, I don't know about you, but I've been doing evangelism for almost two decades, and I still just like the gut, you know, like, you know, and, and you know, the, the, the ice is thick, you know, and you know, like to break that ice and to, to express, the, to, to exercise boldness to start a religious discussion is, is a lot. For me, it's a lot. And, and when I'm on the ski lift, and I'm like, you know, almost sweating a little bit. You go to church anywhere? And there's been times on a ski lift where some person will just, that just like, it sets, like it, it's like they just talk for the whole time. Like, like and, they, and so they just give me their whole religious life story. That's all I asked is, you know, you go to church anywhere? It's like, some, I think some people want to talk religion. Some people do. Um, or some people are like, eh, you know, or, you know, you, you get a read for it. But it's just a, an easy, it's a freebie question. It's so easy. You go, you go to church anywhere? Um, at BYU, we cannot assume the students we're talking to are believing Latter-day Saints. I do not mean that as a dig. I just mean that as a reality. We talk to Latter-day Saints there who are church-going who don't believe, um, who are finishing up their last year and they know if they were to exit the church, uh, institutionally, there's a policy there where you can't be a student there if you're an ex-member, if you take your name off the rolls. So they are just going through the motions. And um, so I'll ask follow-up questions like, I don't mean to be rude, but are you active and believing? Uh, where are you at? I, I like to ask that question. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? I'll even add that. Um, religiously, we're spiritually. What, what do you believe now? Um, if you, uh, you know, a really good question to ask is, uh, what's your faith background? What's your faith background? And, I, and I, where they're at and where they've been both matter. It really helps tell the story of who they are. What's your faith background? I really want to understand if somebody has a worldview, really, that is identifiable. What do they actually believe? Where do you, you know, that, so that, those are... That's off to the races. I mean, if you can get that far, you could pretty much have a... You could, most of the time, not have much of a plan beyond that, and that you're off to the races. <clears throat> and, and does anybody have any related questions they like to ask with respect to someone's religious background? You mean, like, what would we use? Yeah, what, what questions yeah. do you like to ask? Well, I, I, Mm. Mm. Sometimes, how were you raised? Because mm. uh, I, I get a lot where people are like, I mean, not particularly with LDS evangelism, but it'll be like, well, mom was Roman Catholic, dad was a Baptist, they met somewhere in the middle, they went to a Nazarene church, or you know, something <laughs> like that. And that might not mean that they personally subscribe to either mom or dad, or the Nazarene, you know, or the place in the middle, but you kind of know where mm. they come from, whatever their personal. I mean, I guess that sort of is about background, but how were you raised, I think, sometimes is maybe a way to... Because then you maybe know if they're not that now, you know, maybe they left that. Oh, what's mm. your problem with that? I mean, sometimes you have people... I mean, a lot of people, when it comes to faith, are coming from a place that has hurt them somehow, and I think that can sometimes be, rather than necessarily always asking the affirmative stuff, sometimes the negative stuff, even though that's hard to get into, especially on a first, you know, mm. short-term conversation it can kind of help you to understand a little more about where they're... Hmm. Yeah, and it's such a, 
such a blessing and a privilege that someone would even open up and let us hear that story. Um, you know, what's, what's, uh, you know the, the world is big on talking about diversity and inclusion, uh, but you know what, one, of the, one of the most, uh, uh, one of the neatest things you can do in life to have exposure to a diversity of people is share the gospel. <laughs> is, to, is to have a common message of a one Lord, one faith, one baptism uh, of Jesus Christ and take it to the world and, and you're willing to talk with strangers and you get to talk with people from all around the world in Utah. Um, that's, that's the kind of diversity that I, I like to enjoy um, where there's a, there's a focus on the gospel. Uh, and these people are genuinely interesting people. They're made in the image of God. They're our neighbors. Uh, people have you might say, an incomprehensible depth to their heart, their soul, their mind. Um, we're complicated creatures. We're more comp- we don't know ourselves like God knows us. We're, we're, we're some, there's so much depth to ourselves that we can barely wrap our own heads around what we are. So people are interesting. Evangelism is fun, not just because of sharing the gospel, but because we get to know people. Wow, I get to know people. One of the... Uh, Things that I like to ask about in Utah is about someone's mission. Uh, this is a good question around BYU. Anywhere in Utah, did you serve a mission? Did you serve a mission? Uh, did you serve a mission? Where to? Where did you go? And for Latter-day Saints, this isn't uh, merely about a two-year opportunity to share their faith. For many Latter-day Saints, men and women, this is a season of maturation. This is sort of a, this is a spiritually formative season of their life where there was a coming of age. Uh, for many of these young men, they're barely out of mom's home. <laughs> and and uh, this is the entrance into adulthood. So I love to stop and ask, um, what are some highlights from your mission? What are some of your favorite memories? This is especially easy when, you've, when you're not in a rush. Tell me about that. I like to ask, uh, what was the predominant religious demographic on your mission? Um, who, uh, what religion were people that you spoke to? What, um, if, in, if you're in Latin America, you'll often hear, well, Roman Catholic. Well, what kinds of Roman Catholics? Uh, you know, some people went to church, some a lot didn't. Demographic, sorry. Um, a lot of Latter-day Saints serve missions in America in the Bible Belt. So what, what kinds of people did you get to talk to? Did you get to talk to born-again Christians, evangelicals, Presbyterians, even Lutherans? Uh, <clears throat> did you get to talk with any born-again Christians? Did you ever have any interesting... I like to ask this. Did you ever, ever have any interesting conversations with born-again Christians? And I know we're all searching, we're reaching for some sort of helpful term Evangelical, born again, Protestant, historic Christian, take your pick. No judgment here. <laughs> we're, we're searching for some sort of helpful descriptor. Did you ever get to talk with any born again Christians, or evangelicals, or Baptists, or Presbyterians? What did you talk about? What was that like? And maybe sometimes they've had negative experiences. Oh, sorry to hear that. By the way, I am hoping to build on the existing work of other Christians. There is a um, a tactic that I don't want to participate in, and it's called pander slander, where you pander to your unbelieving dialogue partner by throwing believers under the bus or slandering other believers. It's a tactic where you um, speak ill of other Christians in order to be ingratiated to your dialogue partner. And that's a, that's a temptation of the flesh. It's cheap. It's, that's easy mode. That's not hard mode. And we are hard mode evangelists, all right? We, we want to do this the right way with integrity and being supportive of the body of Christ. So what's my agenda? I want to see if they've had existing conversations with other Christians. And I want to ask about the topics they covered. What, what did you talk about? What, what are some of the interesting conversations you had with, with uh, historic Christians, born-again believers? And the, 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 my agenda is I, I'm hoping that they will put a topic on the table. That's, that's what I'm hoping for. I'm hoping that they will introduce a topic that we can talk about. That's really, this is not complicated. This is what I'm doing. 
Did you have any interesting doctrinal conversations? I like to even ask about, did you ever get to have any interesting doctrinal conversations with your fellow missionaries? Like when you're, when you're doing a, a zone, what do you call them, the zone meetings? What do you call this? Zone conferences. Zone conferences. Uh, what are some of the interesting uh, topics y'all liked to discuss? Because missionaries, they're there to share the Latter-day Saint faith, and they're amongst each other, they're talking about really interesting internal controversies and internal discussions. Uh, so I'm trying again to help them put topics on the table. What are y'all speaking about already? And I want to take the existing efforts of Christians and extend to that, build on that, uh, support that. If there was uh, misbehavior by believers, oh, that's unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, but I don't want to focus on tearing down other Christians in order to build up a discussion with the Latter-day Saint. So ask about their mission. I might even ask them about their training. How was the MCC? Ooh. How did they keep, what did they wow. teach you there? Because that, I mean, that's also interesting for us to know too. Like, what are they teaching these guys? Wow. Hmm. I've never thought to ask about that. And, and they're probably also like, oh yeah, because that's like their seminary, right? I mean, yeah. that's like their school, like that's where they trained us to evangelize. What are they telling you guys? Mm. How, do they, how do they tell you how to deal with Christians, you know, or whatever? I mean, I'd be interested to know. Hmm. Did you all know that there's a Facebook group right now for LDS missionaries? Last I checked, I think it has about 13,000 members in it. And it's designed for largely active Latter-day Saint missionaries. And it's called The Calvary. It's a Facebook group uh, dedicated to helping equip Latter-day Saint missionaries largely to talk to evangelicals. <laughs> it's, it's, it's giving them ammo and uh, help to, to respond to and, and deal with us. So uh, it, it's, uh, the, the people who lead it are not good people. Uh, they're kind of aggressive. Uh, uh, they're, they're belligerent. Uh, but these Latter-day Saint missionaries are the, the common missionaries. They're, they're looking for ways to talk with us. They're, what we have to say really does make an impact. They're, they really are listening, and they really do see it as a kind of problem, right? And so they, they feel like they need training on how to respond to what we say. It's a big issue. Um, I, we, some of the missionaries that have been coming, sorry, some of the LDS apologists that have been coming to the street on Thursday nights in downtown Provo are from the Calvary Group. So the, that's, that's the social significance of some of the recorded discussions we've had lately that are an hour to two hours long. You'll, you'll see some recent recordings with some pugnacious uh, Latter-day Saint dialogue partners who are just unusually aggressive. They're from the Calvary group. They're, they're not representative of the common people we speak to. Um, where did you grow up? Extending that question, where did you grow up? Um, I like to ask, in addition to that, did you ever have any born-again Christian friends growing up? Especially for Utahns. I grew up in Tooele, or Salt Lake City, or Spanish Fort. Well, I'm a, I'm a born-again Christian. Did you ever have any born-again Christian friends growing up? There's a dual purpose to these questions. One is getting to know your Latter-day Saint neighbor. The second purpose is to provoke your own heart. Because what you're going to find is that your Latter-day Saint neighbors are far less acquainted with the gospel than you realize. And they, um, <clears throat> when, when, a, when someone says, I had one friend growing up that was a born-again believer. One? Can you pause and just think with me about about that or none and maybe that will help soften your heart whoa um, or if they have had a substantial friendship did you all ever get to talk about anything doctrinal or, or did you ever have any faith discussions with your evangelical friends yeah, did you guys get to talk about interesting doctrine stuff or bible or theology or faith or big question stuff. What did you talk about? You see what I'm doing again? Um, kind of like the missionary discussion question. Uh, did you ever get to talk to any boarding and Christians? What did you talk about? Build on what was already discussed. Did you ever have, ever have any boarding and Christian friends growing up? Um, I'm assessing like how exposed to the gospel they are. 
I want to build on existing discussions that they've had. I want them to introduce topics for discussion on the table. Another question I'd like to ask is, have you ever heard the evangelical gospel summarized before? Have you ever heard the gospel as mainstream Christianity or historic Christianity understands it? Have you ever heard that described in summary fashion before? Have you ever heard this, the gospel summarized before from an evangelical point of view? I love this question. It's a win-win. If they say, yes, I've heard it before, you just say, what did they say? <laughs> and this is great because they either can, in their own words, tell you what they think the gospel is according to the boarding and Christian vantage point. And you can work with that. I mean, if there's anything they're going to put on the table to work with, that's one thing we'd want to work with, right? That's something we'd want to discuss. What did they say? And if it's just, it's often, uh, it's often a very clumsy, problematic <laughs> recounting. It's like, it, it, they don't get it yet, right? And that's okay. I could say, huh, interesting. And even the look on your face, they say, well, is that right? <laughs> you know? And, you know, uh, or you might say, that's interesting. I, I wouldn't quite put it that way. You know, and it, it just creates a discussion about what is the gospel? What is the gospel? What, that's, that's, that's really what we're going for here. What is the gospel? If they say, oops, if they say, no, they have not heard a summary of the gospel before from a born again Christian, can you just pause with me? We're in America. And we're talking to Latter-day Saints who often have never heard a summary of the gospel before from a born-again Christian. Again, let it provoke your heart, melt your heart, soften your heart, slow down the discussion. If you, if you hear no, are you feeling especially motivated to get into a big debate with them? Not at that moment, no. It's not that they've heard it and rejected it. It's that they've, maybe they've heard it and forgotten it. Maybe they've heard it and misremembered it. But they don't have a memory of it. And so what's the number one priority here? Can I share it? No, I've never heard it. Would you mind if I summarized it? you mind if I took a few minutes? Gosh, I hate, I hate to make evangelism into a formula, but that for me is just a really helpful template. It's a t helpful template. This is also reusable as a template on topics. You're talking about authority, temple, priesthood, grace, trinity. Have you ever heard a born-again Christian summarize that topic before? Have you, heard of a Christian, have you heard of a mainstream Christian explanation for that before? Yes. What's your understanding of that? Question, question, question. I want them to talk. Or no, I haven't. Would you mind if I did? Same thing. Same thing. Is that helpful? No? You're tired. Same sort of thing. Uh, what would you say the gospel is? I, I talked to a, a young man Thursday night, and I just asked him, how would you summarize the gospel? What's the gospel? What's your understanding of the gospel? Um, this is sort of a repeat, but how do you get right with God? How do you know you'll be with God forever? Christians uh, have a tradition of asking, if you were to die right now and you were at the gates of heaven and, and, and God asked, why should I let you in, what would you say? That is an awesome question. Let's continue the Christian tradition of asking that question. What makes, what makes you worthy, if even, of entrance into heaven? Why should God let you into the kingdom? What makes you uh, a fitting candidate for entrance into God's presence. And you'll hear me say God's presence. Does anybody know why I might say it that way instead of heaven or hell? In the Latter-day Saint rhetorical space, heaven can mean, I'm not joking, heaven can mean a hellish place where you are eternally regretful, separated from God forever. Have you heard about that? Maybe you haven't. That's okay. In, in the Latter-day Saint worldview, there's a celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom, and 
telestial kingdom. It's a three-kingdom heaven. Only the celestial kingdom is where Jesus permanently dwells, somewhat visits the terrestrial kingdom, and never visits the telestial kingdom. And they call all of that heaven. And Latter-day Saint teacher, there's a kind of a, there's a, there's a, kind of a, um, a dual message about the bottom kingdom. They say, oh, it, this is sort of the spirit of universalism. If you know how awesome the telestial kingdom was, this is sort of like folklore, common uh, Latter-day Saint talk. If you know how awesome the, the bottom telestial kingdom of heaven was, you'd want to commit suicide just to get there. Anybody ever heard that? Very common. But there's also statements by Latter-day Saint leaders that say, because you are permanently uh, blocked from progression, and because you're not with God, and because of other issues, this is a kind of eternal punishment. Latter-day Saint leaders have, uh, I, have a, I have an article on MRM.org about this. If you search up the keywords hellish heavens and heavenly hells, they talk about the, the bottom kingdom of heaven as a, an eternal punishment, worse than, mental, uh, worse than physical torture, a mental anguish worse than physical torture. That's how John Witso described it. So, but they'll also say it's glorious and awesome and you'd want to be there. So there's a kind of like, which is it? Um, so to talk about heaven just opens up a whole new need to define other things. <laughs> so if you, if you want, you can skip that and say, to be in God's presence forever, to, has that, to, to have the best that God has to offer you, to be with Jesus forever. Have you ever noticed in John 14, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He goes on to say, in my Father's house are many rooms, or King James, mansions, and, and the Latter-day Saint tradition says, aha, these are different kingdoms. Well, just listen to Jesus. He says in that same passage, I wouldn't tell you this unless I was coming back to take you back to where I am. The whole context is no one comes to the Father except through me. Whose house is it? It's the Father's house. Jesus is telling you because he's bringing you back to where I am. This is not the hellish heavenly kingdom of separate existence from God. This is being with the Father, with the Son. Sorry. Where are we at? I forget where. Yeah. Okay. Um, so this is why Christians learn to use vocabulary with LDS people that gets to the heart of it. Maybe we don't say heaven, maybe we say God's presence. One of my tool belt questions is, what would you say are some of the most important differences between the Latter-day Saint faith and, insert your own adjective here, because there's the the rhetorical sort of battle over what's Christian, right? It's like you say Christianity, they're like, we're Christians too. And they just lost, the question hasn't even registered in their head. So insert an adjective. What would you say are the most important differences between the Latter-day Saint faith and historic Christianity or evangelical Christianity or mainstream Christianity? Or you might say the, the, the Latter-day Saint tradition or the LDS church or the Latter-day Saint faith. The, the Latter-day Saint movement. What's the, what are some of the most important differences between Mormonism and historic Christianity? Doctrinal differences, faith differences. And I, I, it's a great question. It's a great question. It's one of the most common questions I use. And you stop, you pause, you listen, and you'll often hear, well, the Book of Mormon, or modern revelation, or continuing revelation, or modern day prophets and apostles. And those are super important, but they're not at the top of the list, right? So I'll, I'll often just listen and say, yeah. what else? Oh, yeah. What else? Yeah. Hmm. What else? And what, what do you think I'm hoping to talk about? I'm asking you. What, what other topics am I, am I hopeful that they'll introduce? Christ. Hmm? Christ. 
who Christ is. The gospel of grace. What the gospel is. Who God is. Trinity, nature of God. Uh, Mormons use the language of being literal children of God. What does that mean? So I'm, hoping, I'm hopeful we'll talk about grace and the nature of God. So if there's, if we, maybe we can talk about Book of Mormon, modern day revelation, priesthood. That's kind of at the top of the typical Latter-day Saint list. But if you just keep the list going, you'll get to the nature of God, grace, and the gospel. This is a more intermediate question to ask. Uh, you don't need to be fascinated with Mormonism or an expert in Mormonism to ask most of these questions. This question right here is going to be for more of you nerds that have had a, an LDS background maybe or who are acquainted with Latter-day Saint teachings. I like to ask, and this is for more of the intellectual uh, dialogue partners, what have your leaders taught about that? Uh, what what ha has your church, what has your church taught about that? And the reason why that becomes more important when I'm talking to not a lay member, but a kind of a street apologist, um, a defender, an advocate, a more sort of um, sophisticated Latter-day Saint, where what happens is more sophisticated defense of the Latter-day Saint faith typically goes fringe, typically uh, exits the mainstream views of LDS traditionalism, and in order to defend Latter-day Saint theology, they, 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 they sort of reinvent it. And so I kind of have to bring him back to, I mean, if you're just a lay member, then I, I honestly care more about you as a person than, your, than what your church teaches or history. But it's still relevant, still on the table. If you're talking to me about, if you're talking to me in the capacity more of, of defense of the Latter-day Saint historic faith, then that's, that's on the table. That is a completely legitimate topic. What have your leaders taught about that? Okay, here's some simple continuatives. That's a neat word, isn't it? A continuative. In, uh, in linguistics, uh, you know, you'll see um, in the Greek New Testament, you'll often see these ands or buts, chi or de, and, and, it, and you think, oh, this is a conjunction. <laughs> it's like, no, often it's just a continuative. You've heard, you know, you, you talk in conversation, and, 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 but, but sometimes it's just, con well, I, I refer to these as conversational continuatives. These are really helpful slowing down. Tell me more about that. Huh, what else? Can you unpack that for me? Can you flesh that out? Help me understand. Tell me more about that. Unpack that. How did you come to that conclusion? That's a famous question from Greg Kokel in Tactics. How did you come to that conclusion? Walk me through the story of how you came to that position. That's a very dignifying question, by the way. It assumes a lot. It assumes that there was a process of considering evidence and reading and synthesizing. Sometimes there isn't much of one, but it's a dignifying question. How did you come to that conclusion? Tell me, tell me what are the reasons why you believe that? Okay. Um, these are all questions, but... We talked earlier about the importance of declaring God's word. I really want to get to a place where we can segue to looking at scripture together. So these are the, these are the things I use to get the Bible open. Can I show you a verse from the Bible about that? Sure. That's, that's real simple. We're, we're talking about something. Hey, uh, can I show you a verse about that? And, and, and why is this? This is honestly a scary thing for a lot of Latter-day Saints. They see this as um, the Bible is like a weapon, right? And there's a sense in which it really is and a sense in which we don't mean it to be. Um, but in terms of the tension and the, sort of the cultural aversion to quote-unquote Bible bashing, um, you have to understand how culturally different this is for us. For us, the Bible is milk and honey and meat and salt and light. And when a pastor preaches from the Word of God and it convicts you, we want the conviction, right? Yes, take the Word of God, uh, pierce my conscience, uh, go beneath me and do a work in me and convict me. And so there's a discomfort to that. And Christians are trained to gobble up the discomfort. Yes, it's medicine. 
to my soul. The word is living and active. Um, it, when, the, when the word of God cuts me, it's for my good, right? But is that Latter-day Saint culture? Oh, no, this is an attack for them. This is, aggress- this is inherently aggressive to them. This is a bashing thing for them. Uh, this is not sweet honey. This is not healing. This is not medicinal or spiritually restorative. So we have a very different experience of the Word of God. For them to be corrected by the Word of God is a scary thing. For us, uh, on, on the whole, it's something we welcome, right? So there's different assumptions, the different modalities here. So these are just ways of helping me gently get out this nuclear bomb, <laughs> this, 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 this Bible, this book that has changed the course of history and transformed human lives and determined uh, the pathway of whole nations. I'm, this, 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 this book that we have, in, in a, in these, we have copies over there that are three and 400 years old, we cherish this book. There are people who have died to translate this book. And so for me to get that book out is a big deal. And for Latter-day Saints, it's like, uh-oh, what kind of, where, where is this conversation going? And there's a legitimate worry there too. Like, is this going to get pugnacious? Is this going to get contentious? Is this going to get rude or ugly? Is that a legitimate concern in America in 2024? Are Christians perfect in the way we use the word of God? I've had to repent of the way I've been caustic and exasperated. So there's a lot going on there. To get your Bible out is a big deal. So this is just my way of gently, can we look at this together? Can I share a Bible verse with you? Where do you see that in Scripture? One of my favorite ways to introduce the Bible into our discussion is, do you remember when? Uh, do, you, do, you, do you remember the story of, and I'm dignifying them because often the case, they're Latter-day Saints, they have some exposure and familiarity with what I'm already sharing them with. So I'm not sharing this as though they've never heard it, right? I'm dignifying the fact they've probably already heard it. And I'm reaching into the existing familiarity they have at some level. Do you remember when? Do you remember when? We'll get back to that later. Do you remember when? We'll come back to that. And I'm curious, though, um, if you want to expand the Bible again, when you, I, it just triggered a thought, when you asked them, where do you see that in Scripture, do you use that word? Do you invite them to tell you? Because to them, of course, Scripture means more. Yeah. Is yeah. there, I mean, is there an opportunity for them to tell you, like, here's what I think, you know, Mosiah said mm. about something, or do you not even allow that? Because then I would say I probably wouldn't use the word scripture. Mm. Right. It depends on the, the sort of the scope of what's helpful. Um, there are times where I am interested to see where they root that idea in their own canon. One reason is sometimes the Latter-day Saint distinctive beliefs are found nowhere in their own canon. Um, that would be one issue. But to your point, it's often helpful to narrow that term down to, I would even say the, the four Gospels or the New Testament. One of the questions I like to ask Latter-day Saints is, um, um, especially LDS missionaries, what are you reading lately? Uh, what have you read in the New Testament lately that you've, that you've enjoyed? Like, what are you reading lately? Um, uh, what are, what's, what's, I should have written this down. What's your favorite book of the New Testament? What's your favorite of the four Gospels? And that's like, you know, they say, I love the Gospel of Matthew. And it's like, log that, right? Because when a topic comes up, I can ask, what, what does the Gospel of Matthew say about that? What does the Gospel of John say about that? Do you remember when, right? So I'm like, I want to log that. What, what? That's a good conversation starter or like intermediate step two, step three. What's something you read? What are you reading lately? That's one of my sort of like gentle questions with, with people, and I'm not even sure if it's going to go in the direction of a religious discussion. What are you reading lately? Could be philosophy, could be sports, could be politics. What what, what interests you? Um, but I hope that gets to the so. heart yeah, of it. I was it. almost kind of wondering when it comes to differences, you know, the category above. Because in order to talk to someone, I, I think one of the, I mean, the, the point that you made about, you know, can I, can I take out the Bible? 
I mean, I, I actually thought you were going to finish that sentence with that's that makes Christians nervous because then it's like now I've got to you know point to it or whatever. <laughs> but um, but I wonder if there's some opportunity there to say you know if if I were to talk to you about the Bible. And this wouldn't be the question you would formulate. But, you know, if I'm going to pull out the Bible, are you going to pull out the Book of Mormon and say, well, the Bible's not as good as the Book of Mormon? Or, you know, I would be sort of interested to know, you know, where are you in that, you know. Mm. I, I don't know that it necessarily fits in any of these rubrics, but I, I would sort of want to know if I'm going to ask about the Bible or the Gospel according to Matthew or whatever, are they going to be like, you know, like it doesn't really matter? Most of the time... They don't pull out the Book of Mormon. Most of the time, there's just a lack of familiarity yeah. with the basic things. So it's it's usually, you know, it's usually just a gentle sort of introductory act to sort of showing them what something says. And, I, yeah. I do like your bottom question a lot because I think chapter and verse can be very helpful. Like if you if you need someone to say where is it in black and white, well, you you know should be able to tell them in black and white. But I think sometimes even summary statements or or um, you know uh, your your own do you remember when mm. Christ walked on water or, you know, whatever? Um, because I think people then are a little less affronted by, well, right here in the thing it says this, but do you remember? The, their database for scripture yeah. has better categories for stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's do, let's do invitation questions, and then we'll take a five-minute break. Um, it is tremendously helpful. I... Uh, this, this is sort of a situation where you're listening to a doctor that smokes tell you not to smoke, but um, it's tremendously helpful to gauge when someone's attention span is being exhausted, right? You don't need to say a thousand things. The Word of God's very powerful. Um, and we do want to, it, this is sort of like the proverb that talks about not overstaying at someone's house. Um, there are conversations that need to end. There are great conversations that are going really well that need to end, where you can give it a natural exit ramp and say, hey, can we meet again? Or can we shelve that and talk about it next time? I don't want to evade that. I'm not trying to um, avoid that topic, but can we pin that for later discussion? I think we should talk about that again. What if we went and read about that a little bit and came back and talked about that? Um, This is a great opportunity to get contact information, to invite someone to meet in a public place. Stacy and I, at times, have had people over come over for dinner. I'm having someone come over for dinner. Who? Uh, stranger I met. <laughs> uh, um, or, you know, I'll go out to dinner with someone uh, for pizza. Um, can I invite you to my church? Man, Latter-day Saints are so receptive to that. Um, they're so neighborly about that. That's such a that's such a low-hanging fruit right there. And there's some situations where you can offer to visit their ward, and and then they reciprocate. They they visit your your church, just as a, an act of mutual friendship. Um, can I get your number? Can we talk about that over text. Uh, lately, when I go down to Provo for evangelism, I look through my texting history and I invite my past conversation partners to come back again. Hey, I'll be there again. Let's talk. Or, hey, uh, let's keep the conversation going. It's so silly not to get contact info if you can get it. Are you on Facebook? Can I add you? Are you on Instagram? Um, invite them for a meal. This is where you relational evangelists shine. God has gifted you for this. God has blessed the body of Christ with people who are excellent at this. Okay, let's take a five-minute break. I also want to invite you to leave if you feel like it's a long Saturday, you've got a lot to do, natural exit ramp. It's not socially inappropriate. Just please, if you've got to go. But we have, we have one more segment, and I don't want to abuse your time. But we'll, we'll come back at 10, 11 and talk about conversational pathways. This is more content about God, grace, gospel, authority, priesthood, temple. <laughs>